This is Space Time, Series 20, Episode 88, for broadcast on the 15th of November, 2017. Coming up on Space Time, the star that wouldn't die, the hunt for dark photons, and a rare white dwarf, brown dwarf binary system. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have discovered a zombie star that appears to have risen from the grave. Normally when a star explodes at the end of its life in a cataclysmic supernova, it's either completely destroyed in a thermonuclear or a type 1a supernova, or in the case of core collapse or type 2 supernovae, it leaves behind a stellar corpse marking its grave in the form of a neutron star or stellar mass black hole. However, scientists are now reporting the discovery of a star that appears to have somehow survived its initial brush with death to undertake a second supernova explosion 50 years later. The findings, reported in the journal Nature, are challenging science's existing understanding of these cosmic catastrophes. The study's lead author, Lara Carvey, from the University of California, Santa Barbara, says this new supernova breaks everything astrophysicists thought they knew about how supernovae work. He describes it as the biggest puzzle he's encountered in almost a decade of studying stellar explosions. The supernova, named IPTF 14 HLS, was discovered in a dwarf galaxy some 509 million light years away, lighting up the skies of the constellation Ursa Major. It was first detected by the Caltech led Palomar Transient Factory back in September 2014, looking like an ordinary core collapse Type 2P supernova. The spectrum of core collapse type 2 supernovae normally display Balmer absorption lines, reduced flux at the characteristic frequencies where hydrogen atoms absorb energy. The presence of these lines is used to distinguish this category of supernovae from thermonuclear or type 1 supernova events. When the luminosity of a type 2 supernova is plotted over a period of time, it shows a characteristic rise to a peak brightness followed by a slow, gradual decline. These light curves have an average decay rate of about 0.008 magnitudes per day, much lower than the decay rate of type 1a supernovae. Type 2 supernovae are further divided into two subclasses, depending on the shape of their light curve. The light curves for a type 2l supernova show a steady linear decline following peak brightness. By contrast, the light curves for a type 2p supernova have a very distinctive flat plateau-like stretch during the decline, representing a period where the luminosity decays at a slower rate. This means the net luminosity decay rate is slightly slower, at 0.0075 magnitudes per day for a type 2p supernova compared to 0.012 magnitudes per day for a type 2l. The difference in the light curve is believed to be caused by the expulsion of most of the hydrogen envelope in the progenitor star in type 2L supernovae. While the plateau phase in type 2P supernovae is thought to be caused by the shock wave ionising the hydrogen in the outer envelope, stripping the electron from the hydrogen atom and resulting in a significant increase in how opaque the whole thing looks. The process prevents photons from the inner parts of the explosion from escaping. And once the hydrogen cools sufficiently to recombine, the outer layer becomes transparent. Okay, let's go back to our story. Several months after the initial September 2014 detection of the supernova, scientists noticed that the supernova, which had once been fading, was growing brighter again. And that's a phenomenon never seen before. A normal supernova rises to a peak brightness and then fades over 100 days. But supernova IPTF14HLS, on the other hand, grew brighter and dimmer on at least five separate occasions over a three-year period. Then when scientists examined the archival data, they were astonished to find evidence of a similar supernova explosion in 1954 at exactly the same location. Somehow, this star had survived that initial supernova explosion, only to go supernova again in 2014. In this new study, the authors have calculated that this exploding star must have been at least 50 times more massive than our Sun, and probably physically much larger as well. One of the study's co-authors, Lars Bilston, also from UC Santa Barbara, says this supernova may be the most massive stellar explosion ever seen. He says the most remarkable aspect of the supernova was its long duration, something simply never ever seen before. It certainly puzzled everyone as it just continued to shine. 
Bilston's been working with UC Berkeley astrophysicist Dan Kaysen exploring possible explanations. And the earlier explosion back in 1954 provides an important clue, suggesting that this could be the first example of what astronomers call a pulsational pair instability supernova. Now the idea is, the cores of really massive stars can become so hot that energy is physically converted into matter and antimatter. And of course, matter and antimatter annihilate each other when they come into contact. This then causes an explosion which blows the star's outer layers off, leaving the core intact. Now the idea is such an explosion could repeat over decades before one final cataclysmic explosion and subsequent collapse into a black hole. Another of the study's co-authors, Andy Howe, also from UC Santa Barbara, says these explosions were only expected to be seen in the very early universe involving massive population 3 stars, and so it's thought they should be extinct by now. However, the pulsational pair instability theory may not fully explain all the data that's been obtained for this event. That's because the energy being released by the supernova is far more than the hypothesis predicts. What it means is that IPTF14HLS may well be a completely new kind of supernova. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. In its final years of operation, a particle collider in Northern California has refocused the search for signs of new particles that may help fill some of the blanks in science's understanding of the universe. A fresh analysis of this data limits some of the hiding places for one type of theorised particle, the dark photon, which has been proposed as a possible explanation for the mystery of dark matter. The latest results, published in the journal Physical Review Letters by the roughly 240-member Barbar Collaboration, adds to results from a collection of previous experiments, all of which we've been seeking but not yet finding this long-hypothesized dark photon particle. One of the study's authors, Professor Michael Rooney from the University of Victoria, says although it does not rule out the existence of dark photons, the Barbar results do limit where they can hide. This mysterious substance called dark matter, which accounts for an estimated 80% of the total mass of the universe, has only ever been observed through its gravitational interactions with normal matter. For example, when you look at the rotation rates of galaxies, it's much faster than can be expected based purely on the amount of visible matter present. That suggests there's some missing mass there which we can't see, something which is invisible but nevertheless quite real. Because they have no idea what it is, they call it dark matter. For years now, physicists have been working on theories and experiments to try and explain what dark matter is made of, whether it's composed of undiscovered particles, and whether there may be a hidden or dark force which somehow governs the interaction of these particles both amongst themselves and also with visible matter, the stuff we can see. The dark photon, if it exists, has been put forward as a possible carrier of this dark force. Using data collected between 2006 and 2008 at the SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory in Menlo Park, California, scientists have scanned the recorded byproducts of particle collisions for signs of a single particle of light, a photon, devoid of any associated particle processes. The Barbar experiment, which ran from 1999 to 2008 at SLAC, collected data from the collisions of electrons and their antimatter counterparts, the positrons. The collider driving the Barbar experiment, called PREP2, was built through a collaboration that included SLAC, Berkeley Lab and the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. At its peak, the Barbar collaboration involved more than 630 physicists from over 13 countries. Barbar was originally designed to study the differences in the behaviour between matter and antimatter involving the bottom or B quark, by far the most massive of the six types of elemental quark particles, up, down, top, bottom, charm and strange. Simultaneously with the competing experiment in Japan called the Bell, Barbar confirmed predictions of theorists paving the way for the 2008 Nobel Prize. The latest analysis used about 10% of Barbar's data recorded during its final two years of operation. Its data collection was refocused on finding particles not accounted for in physics' standard model, the cornerstone of science's understanding of the known universe. The signature for a dark photon detection would be really simple, just look for one high-energy photon without any other activity. A number of dark photon theories predict that the associated dark matter particles would still be invisible in the detector. But the single photon radiated from a beam particle signals that an electron-positron collision did occur and that the invisible dark photon decayed into dark matter particles, revealing itself in the absence of any other accompanying energy. 
When physicists first proposed dark photons back in 2009, it excited new interest in the physics community and prompted a fresh look at Barbar's data. Because dark photons could bridge this hidden divide between dark matter and the visible matter of the known universe, the stuff in the standard model. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Astronomers have discovered a link between a galaxy's shape and how fast it rotates. The findings, reported in the journal of the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society, are the first to measure how a galaxy spin affects its shape. It sounds simple, but measuring a galaxy's true three-dimensional shape is a tricky problem that astronomers have spent more than 90 years trying to resolve. The study's lead author, Dr Caroline Foster from the University of Sydney, says it's the first time scientists have been able to reliably measure how a galaxy's shape depends on any of its other properties, in this case its rotational speed. Galaxies come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Foster and colleagues found a clear link, showing that the faster a galaxy rotates, the flatter it tends to be compared to its slower spinning counterparts. Interestingly, the authors also found that rotational speed also correlated well with how circular or disc-shaped the galaxy appeared. The faster the rotation, the more circular the galaxy's disc was. Foster and colleagues were able to reach their conclusions using the Sydney AAO Multi-Object Integral Field Spectrograph, or SAMI instrument, which is attached to the 4-metre Anglo Australian Telescope at the Siding Spring Observatory in country New South Wales, west of Sydney. This is the same instrument used by Associate Professor Sarah Brow in a separate experiment which successfully linked a galaxy's rotation in the galactic cluster to the galaxy's mass rather than the density of the surrounding cluster. SAMI works by giving detailed information about the movement of gas and stars inside galaxies, examining some 61 points on 13 different galaxies at a time. This capability allowed the Australian Astronomical Observatory team to collect data on huge numbers of galaxies. To reach their conclusions, Foster and colleagues used a sample of some 845 galaxies, over three times more than the biggest previous study. And it was this large number which was key to solving the shape problem. Foster says that because the galaxy shapes the result of past events, such as merging with other galaxies, knowing its shape also tells scientists about a galaxy's history and evolution. So what we found is that the, the spin of the galaxy influences its shape, as you would expect, the, I think the more interesting part there is that we had such a large sample for the first time, we were actually able to do this so that we could measure not, not just the one shape for like everything, but we we're able to see how the ch- shape would change as a function of spin. So able not only to measure like how the flatness of the galaxies varies as a function of rotation, which you know you can kind of guess. So if something spins very, very fast, you expect it to be quite flat. And if something doesn't spin quite as fast, then not only is it a little bit thicker, but it also doesn't necessarily have a disk. So it can be a kind of more random shape, like potato shape. Elliptical galaxies, things like that. Yeah, like it was something you think of like an ellipsoid that where the three axes are are different mm-hmm. from one another. Yeah, so that's what we call triaxial in this case. Why did you want to do this work? What is it about the properties of galaxies that we don't understand very well? Yeah, I mean, obviously we've been taking images of galaxies for a very long time now, and uh, even you know before we knew that galaxies were actually separate universes from our own, we had images of them. But from the time, about 90 years ago, where we realized they were actually little island universes of their own, we've been wondering about the properties of these different universes and what actually leads to these different morphologies, if you like, that we could see in 2D. Is it just projection? Or is it actually that they're intrinsically very different in three dimensions? And so I think, you know, the question was kind of first posed, I suppose, in the times, um, uh, in 90 years ago. You can pretty well throw it back to Edwin Hubble, can't you, when first realised that this was happening. Correct. Yeah, exactly. And so I know I think we knew even from like before, just by looking at the images, that it's actually not just projection effect, that there actually are different structures in galaxies, so between the ellipticals, if you like, and the spirals. But we still didn't have a good handle on what proportion of the galaxies are actually triaxial. So when you think of an elliptical galaxy, you think of a sort of a triaxial system. You might think of something that doesn't really rotate much. But what we were finding when we were looking at the dynamics of the stars around these systems is that a lot of them actually rotate. 
rotate. So that was kind of unexpected. How come so many of them rotate? So are they actually triaxial? And that was interpreted as a projection effect. So essentially, a lot of the galaxies look on the sky like they are flattened, but there's disks at seen at, at varying angles, and that's why they rotate. And so these are like lenticular galaxies. And basically what we could do for the first time is to look at, depending on how fast the galaxies are rotating, how flat are those disks? And so that then tells you when you project them, what's the flattest structure you expect to see, I suppose, depending on the uh, rotation. And that tells you in turn about how they form. So if you can imagine, uh, even if you had two beautiful disk galaxies suddenly merging with each other and combining into a sort of a larger galaxy, you can imagine how that might mix up the orbits of the stars. So you might lose that preferential rotation as you mix the orbits of the stars together. And so you, you then can imagine that these violent encounters could lead to sort of more triaxial shapes. And that's indeed the case. And so basically by measuring the intrinsic shape, the shape of galaxies in three dimensions, we're able to say something about what may or may not have occurred in their history, either in terms of merging or in terms of accreting more gas and reforming disks. One of the important aspects of this work has been the use of SAMI at the Australian Astronomical Observatory. So the SAMI is a what we call a multi-object integral field spectrograph. So we've had spectrographs for a very long time, which will take a single spectrum per galaxy. Then we've had integral field unit spectrographs, which will essentially, for every uh, pixel on an image, will take a spectrum. And that will tell us the motion of the stars across the image of the galaxy. And so, for example, if you're looking at a single galaxy, if one side, if you can measure the redshift because you've got spectra, you can tell if one side is going towards you and the other side is going away from you. And so you you can infer rotation in that way. You can get that, but that's costly, if you like, in terms of instrumental time, like how much time you have to spend on each object. And so that limits the sample size that you can get. And the trick here to measure the intrinsic shape is that we need a statistical sample so that we can tease out this third dimension, this triaxiality aspect of the galaxies. We could never tell about triaxiality of galaxies unless we have a statistical sample. And so with SAMI, which is a multi-integral field spectrograph, we can get 13 galaxies at a time where we have that full spatial information. And so now we can get samples that are large enough that we can play that game and we can start measuring the intrinsic shape, the 3D shape of galaxies as a function of whatever other property we want. So the first step was look at spin because that has a very intuitive consequence on the shapes of galaxies. And so that's a good way to test whether or not our method works. And now that we've basically measured what we were expecting to measure, which is a good proof of concept, now we can start tackling questions like how would the age of a galaxy influence its shape or should old galaxies have the same shape as young galaxies? If not, why is that? And that tells you about how galaxies form. Does it get more difficult when you're looking further back in space-time to be able to measure this Doppler shift effect? Yeah, definitely. So when you look far away, the galaxies on the sky look very, very small. So if you combine this with uh, an effect that we call the seeing, uh, which is essentially a blurring from the atmosphere, you end up having so few pixels across your galaxy and it's only so tiny and then it's all blurred that you actually can't measure that the motions anymore very accurately, you know, in this a special sense. So yeah, indeed, there will be a limited redshift at which we can do this. And the galaxies you were looking at, they're all fairly nearby galaxies, ones that would be easy to, uh, I mean, 845 of them, ones that would be easy to determine what their spin was? Absolutely. So they're the ones that, I mean, we're, what we would call in astronomy local universe. How does our own galaxy, the Milky Way, fit in all this. We're in the middle of it, so it's a bit hard to tell. We sort of have a rough idea that it takes the sun, what is it, 240 million, something like that. How does that compare with the spin of our own galaxy? Is it possible to measure that from where we are? Is because we're in the middle of it, that becomes a bit of a difficult task? That's right. I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting question, actually. I mean, our galaxy, um, we know just by looking at star counts and so forth, that it's actually a spiral galaxy. And we know that we're roughly, you know, we're kind of like in the outskirts, if you like, in the suburbs of our own galaxy. We're not right in the center. And if you look across the sky, you can kind of tell that because from Australia, we have a very good vantage point. We're looking right through the Milky Way and you can see the galactic center at certain seasons in the year. And then you can see that most of the star lie in that strip, which we just call the Milky Way. But 
the Milky Way itself is a giant sort of grand design spiral. And so if our galaxy was instead a potato-shaped galaxy, which had very little gas, little uh, ongoing star formation and so forth, it would be a, a much less spectacular sight to look through it. We would just see stars all across the sky. We wouldn't see that giant strip with like patches of darker and brighter areas that are caused by the gas. So we can tell that it's quite a flattened structure because it's got that strip when we look right through it. So it tells us, well, the fact that it's a spiral tells us a bit about its spin, if you like. We've measured uh, the motions of the stars around us. We know that we're going around, so we know there's rotation happening. But just looking across the sky, the fact that we don't see the same thing everywhere we look, that we have that strip, we know that it's quite flattened. This has been done in parallel with other work that's been done using SAMI, looking at how the mass of a galaxy tends to affect its rotation. Yes. And we've also looked at how that and also in correspondence to where the galaxy lives. And then we found that indeed, so we used to think, I mean, earlier publications in that field used to say, so this is work by um, a colleague of mine, Sarah Broff. So basically what she's found in her analysis of the data is that you look at the spin of galaxies and depending on where the galaxies are in the universe, you can see that galaxies that rotate more tend to be in less populated regions and galaxies that rotate less tend to be in more densely populated areas, and that was known before. What she's been able to tease out is the fact that, as well as a, a spin dependence on environment, is that we know that there's a mass dependence. So the most massive things tend to be in the center of the largest, the most dense environments. And so, I mean, for reasons that you know might be obvious, because you expect more merging if there's more neighbors. Okay, and so. More massive galaxies also tend to be in the denser environment and they tend to be the ones that rotate less. So do they rotate less because they're in dense environment or they rotate less because they're more massive? And what she's found is that, in fact, if you take into account the mass dependent, then there's nothing left for environment. So it's really not about where you are that determines how you dense. And so by looking at these characteristics, mass and shape and, and uh, also spin rate, we're yeah. getting a better picture of galaxy evolution, aren't we? That's right. And that will feed into models. And the other interesting interesting aspect, I guess, since you're asking about the theory, I think that I haven't touched on yet, is the whole aspect of the shape of, for example, the dark matter. That was going to be uh, my next question, yeah. <laughs> that engulfs. So a lot of these models include dark matter, and obviously you can imagine with the gravitational interaction between the dark matter and the stars in a galaxy, so the galaxies are engulfed in this sort of halo of dark matter, but we know very little about the shape of that halo, because obviously we can't see it <laughs> very well. well. I mean, we infer its presence, but we can't see it. And so we're hoping that having measured the shapes of these galaxies in the future, and uh, as we do, as we progress better in this work, and we can pinpoint better what exactly changes the shape of galaxies, um, we'll be able to tell something about the dark matter halo in which they're embedded. Because we're expecting that the dark matter has an influence on the shape of the stars and vice versa. That's Dr. Caroline Foster from the University of Sydney and the Australian Astronomical Observatory. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash spacetimewithstuartgary. NASA's Juno spacecraft has successfully completed its eighth swoop down towards the swirling cloud tops of Jupiter, the solar system's largest planet. Confirmation of the successful orbit was delayed by several days due to solar conjunction at Jupiter, which affected communications during the days prior to and following the flyby. Solar conjunction is the period when the path of communication between Earth and Jupiter comes into close proximity with the Sun. During solar conjunction, no attempts are made to send or receive instructions and data from Juno. That's because it's impossible to predict what information might be corrupted due to interference from charged particles emanating from the Sun. So instead, a transmission moratorium is put in place. Mission managers send instructions prior to the start of solar conjunction, and data is stored on board for transmission back to Earth following the event. Consequently, all the science collected during this latest flyby was stored in Juno's memory until Jupiter came out of solar conjunction. 
and the news is good with all the science instruments and the spacecraft studio cam still operational. The newly won data is now being transmitted back to Earth. Juno's next close flyby of Jupiter will occur on December 16. Juno was launched back on August 5, 2011 from the Cape Canaveral Air Force Base in Florida on an Atlas V rocket. It successfully achieved Jovian orbit insertion on July 4, 2016. During its mission of exploration, Juno soars low over the planet's mysterious cloud tops, down to as little as 3,400 kilometres above the visible surface of the gas giant. During these flybys, Juno science instruments probe deep beneath the obscuring cloud cover, studying the planet's atmosphere, weather patterns, composition, internal structure, gravitational fields, auroral activity and magnetic fields. Jupiter is the king of planets in our solar system. In fact, it contains more mass than all the other planetary objects in our solar system combined. So, understanding Jupiter's history and evolution will help scientists better understand the history of the rest of the solar system. However, there's a problem. You see, each orbit around Jupiter exposes the probe to huge amounts of damaging radiation. To combat this, scientists house Juno's most delicate instruments and flight systems in a special radiation-resistant vault. They also limit Juno's exposure as much as possible by keeping the probe on a highly elongated 53.4-day polar orbit away from Jupiter's radiation belts as much as possible. Juno is currently slated to undertake 12 orbits before mission end in July 2018. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. Astronomers have studied a rare white dwarf brown dwarf binary star system. The new observations have shown scientists how some stars can be demoted into white dwarfs by their companion's feeding frenzy. A white dwarf is the stellar corpse of a dead star, the end point in the evolution of sun like stars. Brown dwarfs are substellar objects that fill that gap between the largest planets, about 13 times the mass of Jupiter, and the smaller stars, which are around 75 times the mass of Jupiter. A report in the monthly notices the Royal Astronomical Society claims the rare astronomical pair researchers are now studying is among the lowest mass stellar objects ever observed. The study's lead author, Leonardo André de Almeida from the University of Sao Paulo, says only a few dozen similar-sized pairs have ever been seen. The white dwarf in this system has a mass somewhere between two-tenths and three-tenths the mass of our Sun. However, it is an extremely high surface temperature of around 28,500 Kelvin, almost five times hotter than the surface of the Sun. As for the brown dwarf in this system, its mass is somewhere between 34 and 46 times that of Jupiter. Located in the constellation Perseus, this white dwarf brown dwarf pair orbit each other in just three hours. Like all white dwarfs, the one in this pair was once a normal main sequence star, happily fusing hydrogen into helium in its core. Being more massive than its companion, it evolved faster, eventually becoming a red giant, an evolved bloated star with a core fusing helium into carbon and oxygen surrounded by a shell where hydrogen is fusing into helium. Red giants are the usual destiny of sun-like stars. And as a bloated red giant, its radius may have eventually exceeded the 150 million kilometre radius of Earth's orbit around the sun. Again, the likely fate of our own sun in about 7 billion years' time. Although bloated and physically very large, red giants aren't very dense, and so they have difficulty holding on to the outer gaseous envelopes, which will eventually float off as colourful clouds of hot gas and dust known as planetary nebulae. All that's then left of the original star is its white-hot stellar core, which by now has fused its helium core into a super-dense ball of oxygen and carbon, about the same diameter as the Earth, and which astronomers call a white dwarf. However, in the case of this specific binary stellar pair, the authors think the red giant began a period of violent gravitational interaction with its companion brown dwarf. The brown dwarf then began rapidly stripping material from the red giant. The authors believe the transfer of mass from the red giant to the companion brown dwarf was so violent and rapid, it prematurely exposed the red giant's still mostly helium core. The discovery of this unusual binary system, comprising a hot object with an exposed core orbiting a colder object with a short orbital period of just three hours, may well contribute to a better understanding of the creation of hot compact objects like low-mass white dwarfs. About 50% of low-mass stars in the Milky Way are in binary systems. 
and among high mass stars, the proportion is almost 100%, of which at least 75% will interact in some way, such as matter exchange, the accelerating rotation of components, or stellar mergers. And that's why binary systems are crucial to science's understanding of the life cycle of stars. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. A Vega rocket has successfully launched a new Moroccan spy satellite. Vega's 11th mission for Ariane Space blasted into black late-night skies from the European Space Agency's Kourou spaceport in French Guiana. And they are off. The Mohammed 6A satellite is on its way. Vega number 11 is blazing a trail across the equatorial skies. Over the Guiana Space Center. Normal. He's telling, the, telling us the propulsion is normal. We're heading direct north, out towards the Caribbean. We broke the sound barrier and reached Mach 1 after 30 seconds. Picking up the signal at the station in saint jean du maroni which is here at the Space Center or just outside it. We can hear the rumble of Vega reaching us. The job of the first three La stages is, normal. Le est calme. is to get us away from the Earth. Vega is pushing itself away from gravity. Oh, we need a lot of firepower to do that. We're burning the P-81 first stage. P for premier étage. It's all going normally according to plan. Premier étage means first stage. 80 is the mass of propellant, roughly. It's actually 89 tonnes. Our altitude, 53 kilometres above Earth. Our distance is a straight line if you were to draw a straight line from the pad. And here we are separating the first stage. It's burnt its fuel and we've switched on now the second stage. The Z23 burns for about 1 minute and 40 seconds. Z for Zephiro, which is an Italian wind, a bit like the Sirocco or the Mistral. 23, because it burns 23 tons of solid propellant. Our speed, nearly three kilometers per second, not per hour, per second. We're getting close now to what we call the Carmen line. That's 100 kilometers above Earth. We've just hit it. It's named after the Hungarian-American engineer, aerospace engineer, Theodor von Karman, and it's the border with space. Basically, the higher you go, the thinner the atmosphere becomes, and the faster an aeroplane has to travel to stay up. Once you get into space, the air is too thin to support wings. Separation of the Z-23, ignition of the next stage coming up, the Z-9, and then we can expect the fairing, the nose of the vehicle, to fall away. So we no longer need the fairing because we are effectively in space. We don't have enough friction anymore to cause us any difficulties, so the satellite is safe to be exposed to for space. Now, Vega is particularly well-suited to launch launching Earth observation satellites. This is the 23rd one to travel on board this versatile light launcher. And there are nine more in the order book. The Mohammed is the first of two new top-secret optical imaging high-resolution surveillance satellites being built for the King of Morocco. The 1,110-kilogram spacecraft are based on an Airbus AstroSat 1000 platform and equipped with Thales Alenia optical systems. The new spacecraft are understood to be similar in design and performance to the twin French Pleiades Earth observation satellites now in orbit, as well as the two new Falcon I satellites being ordered from Airbus by the United Arab Emirates. The new Moroccan satellites are believed to have resolutions down to just half a metre. If correct, that would make them as good as their French Pleiades counterparts. 
Ariane Space's next launch is set for December 12, when an Ariane 5 heavy lift rocket will carry four new navigation satellites into orbit as part of the European Galileo constellation. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A new study has confirmed that a mass coral bleaching on the Western Australian coast last year was the most severe coral bleaching event ever recorded anywhere in the world. The research by the University of Western Australia found the worst impact from the 2016 mass bleaching occurred in the inshore Kimberley region. That's despite the Kimberley corals being considered exceptionally stress resistant. Scientists also discovered bleaching at Rocknest Island. Coral bleaching occurs as a result of abnormal environmental conditions, such as heightened sea temperatures due to global warming. This causes the corals to expel their symbiotic tiny photosynthetic algae. The loss of these colourful algae causes the corals to turn white and bleach. Bleach reefs can recover if temperatures drop and the algae are able to recolonise the coral, otherwise the coral may die. Scientists found that up to 80% of corals on inshore Kimberley reefs were bleached, and this included the Montgomery Reef, which is Australia's largest inshore coral reef. A new study claims a protein called interleukin-11 could be the key to new therapies for currently incurable heart, lung and kidney diseases caused by a buildup of excess scar-like tissue known as fibrosis. The findings reported in the journal Nature indicate blocking interleukin-11 could be a new way for treating diseases involved in fibrosis, including cardiovascular disease and kidney or renal failure. Meanwhile, a separate study reported in the New England Journal of Medicine has found treatments commonly used to prevent acute kidney failure and its complications arising from common angiography procedures make no difference to health outcomes. Scientists studied the effectiveness of two common treatments used to prevent serious harm to patients undergoing angiography. Researchers investigated the effects of both sodium bicarbonate and N-acetylcysteine, finding that neither were any better than using saline alone. A new study claims a regular diet, which includes eating lots of nuts, is linked to a lower risk of developing cardiovascular disease or coronary heart disease, compared to people who weren't quite as nutty. The findings, reported in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, looked at over 210,000 people over 32 years of follow-ups. Unlike previous studies, the new research looked at specific types of nuts, including peanuts, walnuts, tree nuts and peanut butter. Researchers admit they still have more to nut out about this study because the intake was self-reported and limited to white health professionals. However, an accompanying editorial says unprocessed, unpeeled raw nuts could be incorporated into a heart-protecting diet to help promote healthy ageing. Paleontologists have discovered the first Jurassic ichthyosaur fossils found in India. The near-complete 5.5-metre-long fossilised skeleton, reported in the journal PLOS One, was discovered in Gujarat in what's thought to be Mesozoic-era rock between around 165 and 90 million years ago. That's during the time of the dinosaurs. While many ichthyosaur fossils have been found in North America and Europe, in the Southern Hemisphere, their fossil records mostly limited to South America and Australia. The ichthyosaur fossil was found among fossils of ammonites and squid-like belemnites, and its tooth wear patterns suggest that it fed on these hard abrasive animals. The discovery throws light on the evolution and diversity of ichthyosaurs in the Indo-Madagascan region of the former Gondwanda land, showing India's biological connectivity with other continents during the Jurassic. And finally for now, well you've probably already known or at least suspected this, but a new study has confirmed that people who are losers really are more likely to believe in conspiracy theories. And it doesn't matter if the conspiracy involves shape-shifting reptilian aliens running the world, the moon landings being faked, the 9-11 Al-Qaeda terrorist attacks really being an inside job, vaccines causing autism, or aircraft contrails really being chemtrails spraying mind-altering chemicals. It seems people who feel they've lost control of their lives or have been hard done by will often try to justify their situation by believing in conspiracy theories. The findings reported in the scientific journal Political Research Quarterly are based on studies by scientists at the University of Wisconsin-Madison who found that conspiratorial thinking and motivated reasoning both have strong influences on conspiracy theories. 
Scientists used a survey of 1,230 people conducted before and after the 2012 US presidential elections to see why some thought that widespread political fraud had swung the outcome. Before the election, some 62% of those surveyed said that if their preferred candidate lost, voter fraud would have somehow been involved. However, for Democrats, that dropped to just 39% after Obama won the election. While on the other hand, Republicans became far more likely to believe that dirty tricks played a part. The findings show how people who are on the outside, or who've lost what they previously perceived as being a degree of control, were more likely to believe in conspiracy theories. And it works for both sides of the political fence. When George W. Bush was elected president, it was the Democrats who propagated conspiracy theories, including 9-11, Wharf Royal and Halliburton. And when Obama won office, prominent conspiracy theories came from the Republican side of the aisle. And in case you haven't noticed it, with Trump now in the White House, it's back to the Democrats pushing the conspiracy theories. Researchers say their study shows it's the losers who tend to propagate the most conspiratorial theories. The study also found that people with conspiratorial predispositions tend to believe that much of their lives are being controlled by plots hatched in secret places. The findings explain why some people, especially those who feel they have little control over their lives, or believe they've been hard done by, believe in almost every conspiracy theory they hear. It's all because they're trying to deal with their own lack of influence. Researchers found it wasn't critical thinking or evidence that drives people to believe in conspiracy theories, it's their own biased interpretations of what they see. The new findings follow on from two previous studies, one by the American Psychological Association and the other by the European Journal of Social Psychology, which found that some people believe in conspiracy theories in order to feel unique or important, again, a way to get control back in their lives. One study by the American Psychological Association looking at over a 1,000 people found those who supported conspiracy theories felt they were special or unique because they possessed information no one else had. And the more unique those people wanted to be, the more likely they were to believe in a particular theory. Researchers found conspiracy theories serve these people's desire to be unique, highlighting a motivational underpinning of conspiracy belief. The second study, also involving over a 1,000 participants, found a strong desire to stick out from the crowd also drove irrational beliefs. They also found that people who wanted to be unique were more likely to believe and endorse conspiracy theories. And the more exclusive the conspiracy theory was, the more likely they were to believe it. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., around the world on TuneIn Radio, and as part of Virgin Australia's in-flight entertainment. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 